noted social studies educator Walter C. Parker wrote, the real test of a social studies program comes in the out-of-school lives of children. The students working with Tim Kipp are members of an after-school program tackling the enduring public issue of child labor. They use their knowledge of history and problem-solving skills to contribute to solving this age-old problem. The purpose of social studies for me, well, as I tell the kids, it's to change the world. That um, what, what I, the kinds of things that I teach, the ways that I teach, are I hope to be models for ways that they can take action. Um, I love I love the teaching of history as well as social studies in general, but the um, you know, and so, and I love the content, and I and I, I definitely emphasize that. But the, but it's the process. It's uh, what type of content are we studying? So I'm looking at the civil rights movement or some social, um, some social movement where people have, have been able to make a change. People have been able to have a, have an impact on the uh, on the world. The child labor situation in the United States was quite serious a hundred years ago, and now it's almost gone. So I guess the United States could sort of be a model for other countries. I think one group of people that's had a big effect on us, it was actually just a few years ago. Um, I don't know if you heard the story about Iqbal Masi. Um, I don't know, Iqbal Masi was an 11 year old Pakistani uh, worker. He was born into bonded labor, or no, he was sold into bonded labor. And finally he was released and he uh, received the Reebok Youth in Action Award, speaking out against child labor. Um, came to the US, received the award, and spoke to a bunch of, bunch of people. And when he went back to Pakistan, he was assassinated. He was shot in the street in his hometown. It just kind of gives you an idea of what some child laborers who speak out on the issue, uh, what they face upon returning to their countries. This group, um, the Broadmeadows School, I think they were in Massachusetts. They had had Iqbal come and speak to them. And then they, um, they decided they were going to start raising money to build a school, a school for Iqbal. And they found out that, they started that after they found out he had been assassinated. So really they, um, we've looked you know, to them as kind of our inspiration for what we can accomplish. They raised something like $60,000, probably even more, I don't even remember the real figure. And they built a school in Pakistan, called it a school for Iqbal. So just people like them who have really you know, started to fight and we just look to them as, to provide the inspiration for our project. I brought some kids to hear Noam Chomsky speak a number of years ago, and one of the banners where he was speaking said, knowledge is not enough. And the kids are saying, what does that mean? And they figure it out, and they did. That, yeah, so good people can, can learn um, and know about the theory of, of citizenship and active participation, but if we don't do anything about it, it's, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't serve much of a purpose. You know, there's so much going on, so many human rights violations in the world that there's no way we could you know, even, even take a big chunk out of it if we tried. So really what we had to do was just focus on one, one little aspect of it all. But I think that um, child labor is such an important, you know, such a, a big human rights violation and it means so much to us because it's kids like us who are involved in it. Um, the more we can make those two, two entities, the classroom and the outside world, one, um, in a real sense, not just some theoretical sense, that's all we're ever usually doing, then, then I think learning really goes as a, as a different dimension and it, it has a, a, a la more lasting effect. This has been going on for such a long time that it would be hard to go in and change it. But what we want to do is not go in and totally change things. We want to improve people's lives. And it's going to take time, but I think by increasing people's wages, and getting them so they don't have to work all the time, and then possibly getting them to be able to go to school for half days, they'll start to see how they can have better lives, how their lives can change. I mean, it, it'll take a long time, but hopefully in 50 years or 100 years, people in third world countries like Bangladesh, children will be going to school and not working 20 hour days. I am constantly aware of that whole dynamic to make sure, number one, that the kids are, are realistic about what they're doing. They they know they know ultimately know that they're you know the world's not going to turn into a into a um, into a unique or utopian society. The uh, but if they know that they're trying and if they have that kind of that that motivation to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to try to make a difference, then that's 
then I think and that's, that's part of the empowerment process that leads to democratic action. People are alienated because they don't see the system working. But so if we can take kids at this age, even elementary school kids like we saw today in the child labor conference, if we can take, take them to a level and saying, yes, we can make a difference, then, then um, participation uh, becomes almost a natural uh, dynamic. It's not something that, um, say, well, geez, I have, maybe I should go do something, but rather it becomes part of their normal life. And if we go beyond the traditional way of looking at um, participation or citizenship as, well, every two years I'm going to vote, I mean, that is just such a very narrow, very narrow definition of what citizenship's about. That's just one small component to it. It's all the work that goes behind that and around that that's really what makes for citizenship. By being involved in CLIA and stuff, I'm, I'm getting my voice heard. I think that definitely CLIA could be a model for um, how other classrooms are run because the most important thing with CLIA is that the advisors just step back and just let us run. They, they say, okay, you want to have a conference? Well, you plan it, you know? You know, who do you want to speak? You tell us, you know, we'll get them. Um, you want to teach them about it? Teach them about it yourself. Certainly the most responsibility was on you as the individuals, and that's what we wanted. You know, we're not just having adults speaking to adults or adults speaking to kids. It's, it's you folks teaching. You're the ones who are the leaders. We do basically everything. We teach new members. We run all our meetings. We decide um, what we're going to do as an organization. That could definitely be brought into you know, the high school as a whole. How is CLIA, our child labor group, a model? And, and, and these kids are self-selected for sure. Um, and so how do, we, how do we engage more people in the process? I think that's basically what you're asking. Um, well, I have an advantage because I can do it through the classroom. So I can be passionate about what I'm teaching. And as I told them in our, in our, in our uh, reflective session after today's conferences, you know, passion is a critical part of, of social change. Well, it's certainly a critical part of teaching. Any good teacher knows that you've got to really be, got to show that interest that's coming through you. And so if I can convey that to kids, no matter what social class they are, no matter if they're college prep kids or they're, they're kids with learning challenges or whatever, whatever it is, if I can show that kind of passion and interest, then that I think will, um, will hopefully influence them to maybe go beyond their narrow view of the world, which is usually, as a teenager, defined around themselves. Um, and so we've had some success in getting kids from different social backgrounds to get involved. If I obviously care a whole lot about child labor and I put, like, if I put my whole self into presentation and really, you know, just let my emotions go with my teaching, then I think that will motivate uh, kids in turn to become interested in the subject. I think it was really empowering. Like, I thought it was great to see all these students. I know in my presentation group we had students who were really motivated and sounded very enthusiastic about going back to their school and starting up a chapter. And that just makes me feel so much more enthusiastic and excited about the work that I'm doing to see other students going out and trying to do the same. Hearing these women say that, you know, that she lived in an eight by eight apartment with three of her coworkers and there were only two beds and like it was it's just so incredible just to like it just brings it to life for you. I think the phrase that I'm gonna remember most from this day is when Charles Cunningham said that we are the voice of the voiceless. That was truly like truly inspiring to me and it really made me wanna as people said really made me want to get out and do something, you know, because I feel like I have the responsibility to do that. Researching child labor and then hearing someone speak about it is an entirely different experience. And it, I guess it kind of just went over my head when I read it, but hearing it just really like, was a lot, it was touching. Well, it's, it's hard being a teenager because a lot of times adults aren't as willing to listen to teenagers because they think we don't know what we're talking about. But um, people like Charles Carnegie and his gr a committee of five people are just an example of how just a few people can change the world. I mean, and if they can do it, why can't we? Why do we believe that we can do something? I guess because if you consider the alternative, none of us can live 
with that alternative, meaning that we would just accept it. You know, and in, in my teaching and what I try to convey to students is that we should never accept things if we don't like them. We should do whatever we can to try to change it, even if it's a very small thing, it's, even if just an incremental step, or if it, if it gets into a much deeper uh, commitment to social change, and that may mean um, putting together an organization that will fight against a particular evil, such as child labor. So it's, you know, for, for me, and I know for those passionate kids that I work with, the, um, there is no alternative. We have to do something. With so much, you know, so much talk about, like negative talk about teenagers in the world, you know, all teenagers are druggies or, you know, teenagers all they just want to do is just drink and have fun and play sports. I think that using taxpayer dollars to, you know, to support activism is a great way to show the rest of the country that teenagers are not apathetic. We are not just, you know, we're not the MTV generation. We don't want to just sit around and have a good time, but we care about, we care about, you know, the whole world. We care about all types of people. So I think that, you know, groups like Kalia and other, like, Students for a Free Tibet, United Students Against Sweatshops, it's just our chance to show the world that, you know, we are not the apathetic generation and that we can and will do something to make this world a better place. People who think that teenagers couldn't or can't change things should just watch what we're doing. I have, a, I have a one last homework assignment for you, as I tell them at the end of the year. It says, I want, you to, I want you to leave the world a better place than you found it. In a vibrant democracy, after understanding comes action. These students bridge school learning with community action. They use their skills, knowledge, and passion to find the common good and work toward a better world. Their out-of-school lives show a deep commitment to justice, equality, and service to others. They are prepared to take their places as intelligent, active, and caring citizens.